Okay, come, uh, left arm for today, right? Okay, can you guys take out both tutorials? Okay, both group two, group 17, but and the period three on also. Okay, I think we shall start off with period three elements. Uh, later on, three. I, I think it's better to start with group 17 elements first. Group two, group 17. Yeah, we take that out first, okay? And uh, oh, you have your notes also, lah, because a lot of the practice we have today, right? It's going to be quite content game. Okay, so probably going to have to refer to the notes. Okay, but I will tell you guys later on as we go through different types of questions, right? How to prepare for such questions in the exam. Okay, because I do not want to just blanket statement and tell, tell everyone to just memorize. Uh, not very effective. Okay, so let's take a look at the tutorial first. Okay, uh, I would say the more important tutorial is group 2 and group 17. Uh, so we try that first, right? Later, period 3, we will do uh, in the second half of the lesson. Okay, so come, let's take a look first. Okay, not many question types to cover today. Uh. Okay, but let's do a quick overview of what this group, uh, two group 17 is all about us. Okay, so remember, uh, when it comes to group two group 17 elements, we mostly want to navigate the periodic table. Yes, we can go down the group lab, right? Because we're doing two groups. Okay, but what's more important is how to cover few properties. Okay, when it comes to group two, these guys can only oxidize, right? Okay, so that means they are acting as reducing agents. Okay, so this is something you need to do. Okay, so next, okay, when it comes to group 17, okay, we take a look at them acting as oxidizing agents. Okay, so clearly uh, the strength of the elements will vary down the group. You are meant to explain that trend. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, all these are trends up. Uh, Okay, but the most important one out of all this, right, is your group 2 carbonates or group 2 compounds. These compounds are, can undergo thermal decomposition. Bye-bye. Okay, bye -bye. okay, thermal decomposition, right, is the very long explanation that we went through that lesson. A lot to do with polarizing power, a lot to do with charge density, and a lot to do with breaking of bonds. Okay, so remember, the main focus of thermal decomposition is the breaking of bonds. This one has a lot of the keywords that we talked about. Okay, but the moment you break that bond, I'm not going to say which bond, you're going to undergo thermal decomposition. Okay? Of course, uh, the next thing that not, not too important one to be for, you know, actually, I would say it's quite important also. For group 17 elements, right? Okay, we will also look at volatility. Okay, other than volatility, also have thermal decomposition or thermal stability. Uh, but they are complete, we are looking at completely different factors here, which I already talked about. Okay, group 2 compounds thermal decomposition is explained in a much different way than group 17 thermals. As for volatility, we did mention uh, that I don't want you guys to think of volatility. You should be thinking of boiling points inversely proportional to boiling point, in other words. Okay, volatility and boiling points are two very interrelated concepts. But of course, boiling points are a lot easier to process. So you should think of that first, then you link your answer to volatility afterwards. That's mainly it, right? For group two and group 17 elements already. Yeah, okay. So there's of course small little other trends like atomic radius, ionization energy. Not really gonna go much into that. Okay, but we can take a look at period three also. Huh? Okay, period three, not much, okay, because I already told you guys how to study this portion last lesson already. The breakdown of the content. Okay, but more importantly, right, okay, we have three different, uh, different segments. Uh, okay, we have the elements, we have the oxides, and we have the chlorides. As long as you study these three, uh, should be safe. Okay, but I rather tell you guys what is required. Uh, for elements, uh, there's some stuff here and there, like body points, and we have electrical conductivity. Stuff like that, which are not too important. Because mainly, uh, they are testing you on oxides and chlorides. Later, you will refer to it. Okay, so I already did like some of the pages for you guys also. Okay, for oxides, right, the most important one is how they react with water. So can they dissolve the water or not? And most importantly, what's the pH after you dissolve in water? Let's mention that also. Uh. You dissolve the water, you create either an acidic or basic solution, and you're meant to remember to memorize all these pH values because they 100% will pass on huh? Okay, other than reaction with water, you also must tell me about their acid base properties. So remember, uh, there's basic from uh, basic oxides which are metal, acidic oxides which are non-metal, and then we have one guy in the middle called endotheric. Okay, that's your aluminium oxide. 
Chlorides are roughly similar only, but we only discuss the reaction with water. But this one here has a little bit more equations involved. Yes, you do need the pH values as well, but how do you derive these pH values, right? It's by two different segments. One, you must tell me whether the salt or ion or whatever, right, can undergo hydration. And if it can undergo hydration, can it proceed further to hydrolysis? We have mentioned both definitions before. Let me just recap you guys verbally. Hydration means to dissolve the ion in water. They form ion dipole interactions. Hydrolysis is an actual reaction uh, to break bonds. Okay, so hydro means use water. List, list means to break. So we are trying to break an OH bond, which we have discussed before. When you break the OH bond, uh, you release H plus ions. The H plus ions will contribute to acidic pH levels. That's pretty much it for content. Okay, and as for question types, later we'll discuss. More important question types lie here under group two decom thermal decomposition and possibly over here between oxides and chlorides. That's from my experience, right? Where most of the questions will lie at. Of course, uh, there's going to be small little trends here and there, like atomic radius, ionization energy, but all that you are already required to know since G1. Uh, those are not new stuff. Okay, uh, we will try certain selected questions today. Okay, we don't have time to try everything. So perhaps let's look at the group two, group 17 tutorial, right? I just need you all to look at question one. Question one is to start things off. A thermal decomposition question. It is a standard question that you guys can find from the notes. Again, now guys, examples that you can find from the notes are, are unlikely to appear in exam because exam they like to give you application. This one is just for you guys to first understand the basic concepts. Later, we will see how they apply this concept into a slightly uh, interesting looking graph. Okay, but again, I want you guys to try without referring to the notes. Uh, that's why right, your answer don't have to be very nice. You want to do point form, you want to do short form, you want to jot it down, scribble it. I don't really care. Okay, uh, I want you guys to come up with a rough answer first. Like it's like a truck. Later, then I'll show you guys the real answer where we are 100% more confident. Okay, now just I know about 50% confidence rate uh, to go and do this question. Never mind, give it a try first. Okay, so I give you guys maybe two minutes, right? Just, just jot down your ideas. You don't need to write your answer to nice. Okay, so that is how we are going to study this topic. Huh? The first draft of your answer is anyhow. Uh, okay, I won't say anyhow, lah, okay, but not the best answer. Okay, so it's very fast. Uh, point form. Scribble down whatever keywords you can possibly remember. Second draft, then I'll iron it up with you guys. Okay, you confirm will miss out on one or two keywords, and right? it's completely fine. Right? It's part and parcel of doing this kind of content topics. Okay. Okay, this, will, this also kind of reminds me that I'll be telling you guys how to prepare for organic talk. They thought I would discuss that in the videos. Okay.
Okay, so about two, three minutes is up. Okay, let's take a look at your answer. Okay, your okay, of course, right? Uh, remembering a very long chunk of turn of text, right? Very hard. Okay, so this is your flow. Okay, you should have this flow, your head. Okay, then afterwards, right, you can put it into words. Okay, so whenever you think of this question, I want this mental image to appear in your head. Four stage process. So the very first one is when you go, to, okay, of course, you're going down the group, right? Okay, so let's put it our answer. Huh? I want you to check the answer, and of course, we'll check for all the requirements. If you fulfill most of the requirements, that's a good sign, huh? because I know you only see this a few times, and if you can fulfill most of the things, right? Okay, that's very good. Okay, but first, down the group, huh? you must first tell me that the charge stays the same, but the ionic radius increases. Now, by doing this, right, okay, you will first establish your charge density, okay? So you then tell me, uh, okay, so hence charge density decreases polarizing power also decreases. Now, I did focus on this the last lesson. Charge density and polarizing power should be in the same sentence. They are interrelated. So the moment you all think of this, uh, they are both a pair, right? You'll never forget it in the exam. Okay? So when you, what are you trying to polarize, guys? Who are you polarizing? Any idea? What are you polarizing? There has to be someone else that you polarize, right? Okay, so the, the metal ions are polarizing the... Okay, is it the CO3 2 minus? What's the full thing? What are you actually polarizing? It's not, you're not, you don't polarize CO3 2 minus, you polarize the watt of CO3 2 minus. The electron cloud. Okay, good. So make sure that two term is inside. Okay, don't, let's not cut corners here. Okay, polarizing power decrease. The M2 plus ion polarizes the electron cloud of CO3 2 minus to a smaller extent. Ah, okay, that's what we mean by the second step here of polarizing power. Polarize electron cloud. Okay, just pay attention to that. And guys, after polarizing the electron cloud, it can't just not achieve anything, man. You'll polarize it to the point, uh, you'll attract all the electrons closer to the ion, to the point where the bond itself just becomes weakened. Okay, so now we are talking about extents. Uh. If you polarize it to a smaller extent, then guys, what will happen? The OH bond... Hey, sorry, what am I saying OH bond? No, I got confused here. Hey guys, this is CO bond, uh, my bad. If we are polarizing CO3 2 minus, so it's the CO single bond. Like that. Okay, so the CO bond will be weakened to a larger or smaller extent. Any idea? You polarize it less, so you also weaken it less. Make sense? Okay, you can't polarize it more suddenly. Okay, so the CO bond will be weakened to a smaller extent. Okay, guys, then guys, after you weaken the bond, the bond must eventually be broken, right? Okay, now when you break the bond, you also require energy, right? Okay, do you need more energy or less energy when the bond is weakened to a smaller extent? More energy, good, okay? Weaken it less. So you yourself need to input more energy to break the bond. That's a double negative that I've highlighted before. So thus, more energy is needed to break the CO bond. I need to see the keyword break. Because if you weaken the bond and you don't break it, there is no thermal decomposition. Then the whole thing just doesn't make a, a lot of sense. Okay, so energy. Finally, uh, then you can link it back to thermal stability. Okay, so guys, the thermal stability in this case, does it increase or decrease? So this is where some of you guys might pause to think a little bit. You might take a, you might have a double take a, because uh, what, what, what is energy and stability? So remember, thermal stability is the resistance to thermal decomposition. So think about it this way. Uh, if we need more energy to break it, is the compound more resistant or less resistant to heat? Uh, okay, you have to put more energy, that means it's more, it's more strong, right? It's very resistant. More resistant just means thermal, thermal stability decreases. Personally, that's the way I use uh, to visualize thermal stability. 
I think about the word resistance all the time. Okay, and that's your full answer. Again, uh, you don't have to follow exactly what six bullet points. The bullet points are just for me to make my answer a bit more structured. Look at the keywords. The keywords here are definitely the most important one. All right? We're going to do this just once. Okay, where I break it down slowly for you guys. For the next couple of questions, right, where we do application, this one you will start to pause it your again, right? Okay, we do it now uh, so that before the exam, we have less, less things to worry about. Okay, any issues so far? Okay, so I know this first question, they also focus on uh, temperature. Okay, if you need more energy, that means the temperature also increases. Lah. Okay, so that makes the same, it's in the same category. Lah. If the question asks for thermal de uh, decomposition temperature, ah, then maybe you don't use the word stability, you change it to the temperature required. All right, okay, so it's around the same uh, range. Okay, so come, let's take a look at uh, another question. Uh. Now we're going to look at group 70 first. Again, easy questions. Let's flesh out all the content. Application comes later. Question two. Okay. Well, there's even a KSP question over here. So not a hard KSP question at all. Okay, but come, guys, let's take a look. I want you all to do 2A and B. Because both of them are content questions that we've done in the past week. Yeah, okay, later, later you'll see part D. Uh, D is uh, somewhat of an application. We worry about that later on. Okay, yes. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Again, your answer you can just write in pencil first. Later you can write the full answer after that flash down, guys. Okay, point form. Just draw down your ideas. Uh, okay, for two A and B. Okay, one is called volatility, the other one we are looking at thermal stability of group 17 hydrants. Okay, first question, volatility is basically a boiling point question. Okay, basically a cat boiling question that we've done many, many times. Okay, another two more minutes. Right, try to complete A and B. 
Okay, under exam conditions, you look at the mark allocation as a way to gauge your time. Okay, so for AMP total four marks, right? But again, this one comes with a, a bit of experience to spot questions. By right, this one you are given six minutes, lah. By right. Okay, but I feel that this one don't need all the way to six minutes. Lah. Okay, so by now you should just move on to part two. Very he gives me to be why you yeah that means that means can wear pants can be that yes that part of the stuff we So uh, pretty much written the answer for both A and B already. Okay. Data are high keywords if you guys are bringing us through the process again. Okay, again, I do not want you guys to just memorize the answer and plug and paste it onto the correct question. Okay, there's a way to think of the answer in exam one. So again, my main motto is to reduce any memory work possible. Although this topic is very memory heavy, especially in this segment where you need to memorize equations. Here can be very, very easily uh, impromptu question in exam. Lah. Okay, number one, volatility. I can tell you guys that this is essentially a boiling point question. A boiling point question for simple molecules is basically your intermolecular forces. And to discuss intermolecular forces, I did tell you guys electron count size should be your first factor to discuss. Clearly, it becomes larger down the group, which is more easily polarized. And look at that, it's just a typical chem bonding question. Ideally, attractions become stronger, which requires more energy to overcome. First two statements, pretty much the same. It's just that the third statement you need to mention. Bonding points increase, thus volatility drops, because they have an inversely proportional relationship. So at the end of the day, not hard, not hard at all. Okay, again, there's no way, there's, there's no need to like think very hard for this because number one, it is not an application question, and number two, this is meant to give you marks. Okay, we can also move on to part B, la, okay, but I want you guys to make sure all these keywords are fulfilled. Do make a mental note, right? Which keywords you didn't manage to write first time. Like, for example, I don't know, maybe you all forget to write uh, more easily polarized or something. 
Ah, okay, then you just make a mental note. Of, so that means the next time this happens, you cannot miss out on the keyword. Okay. Uh, okay, that one means uh, you are not actually making all these mental notes. Right? Okay, so that's how you sort of memorize content uh, in a way. Again, I don't like to use the word memorize. Okay, I'll use it very loosely. Okay, it's part B uh, that we can actually kind of derive the answer. Okay, so for part B, I did mention for you guys, uh, you must first understand what group 17 hydrides are. They are just known as HX. And coming back to what I went through just now, uh, when you want to thermally decompose literally anything, you need to break bonds. And that's the bond that I'm trying to break. If you notice, uh, hydrogen halides are literally only made out of one bond. So clearly, this is a bond strength factor. See how I'm turning the question into something more familiar? Okay, thermal stability, you're like, shit, in exam, you start panicking because you don't know, you, you forgot which part because you know a lot of things. Okay, then suddenly you realize it's about bond breaking, okay, and you only need to break one bond with hydrogen halides. Whereas for just now, uh, if you take a look at group two compounds, right, for example, magnesium carbonate, we are not exactly just breaking the bond there. Because you have to first realize uh, they are split into two different items, a uh, CO3 minus ion, and then an Mg2 plus ion. The bond that you're trying to break is clearly this guy, but it's induced by the charge density of the ion that's inside it. Here, it's just literally the bond itself. You can see the difference. This guy influenced this bond to break, but this guy just breaks by itself by putting heat inside. Right, okay, so let's take a look. Huh? Now that you know it's a bond strength question, you must need keywords like effectiveness of orbital overlap, and the effectiveness of orbital overlap is dependent on the size. So the atomic radius of the halogens become larger down the group. Lah. Larger means you overlap worse. Okay, so the effectiveness of orbital overlap drops. Uh, the bonds become weaker, so less energy needed to break the bonds. Okay, it's more overcome. Okay, but please make sure the word break or overcome is in your answer also. And then you think of the same thing. Guys, if you require less energy, means what? Are you more resistant to heat or less resistant? Clearly less resistant, right? Less resistance means thermal stability drops, no? Okay, so this is like the easier version of thermal stability compared to just now. A lot easier. This one legit, I cannot get wrong. Your, your first question that you did just now, right? Okay, if exam, if you saw one keyword, I can understand because uh, it's long and you have a lot of things on your head. Okay, but this one, I don't cannot. This one, you really do too many times really to get it wrong. Okay, so four marks like that in the exam, I can tell you guys must secure because of, Towards the later half of the question, they have more application stuff. And those are, are harder to secure marks. Okay, so I want you all to get into the mindset uh, that the exam is not about getting all questions correct. It's about knowing which questions you can get correct the most easily. Okay, it's to get to back as much marks as possible. Okay, and if you are okay with that, I want you guys to try part C, you know. So treat this lesson as a kickstart to, to kind of like begin this content revision journey, right? Okay, uh, C part one, very fast. C part two, kind of basic because we've done it before, right? Okay, so I'll give you guys three minutes for this.
Okay, can you all see the number of the do KSP? No? Okay, never mind. Come, let's let's go through this first. Lah. Then we can proceed over to part B, but part B is more important. Okay, uh, just remember some of your PSD knowledge. Okay, for part C, they ask you to come up with an expression for PBCL group. For that to happen, let's come up with an equilibrium equation first. Okay, guys, how does PBCL group dissolve in water? What does it become? What does it dissociate into? Okay, PB2 plus N. How many CL minus? Okay, two. Okay, so you get that first. Huh? Okay, remember this is an equilibrium because it is sparingly soluble. Okay, then afterwards, using this, we can just come up with our TSP expression. Okay, hey guys, how do you write the TSP for this? In fact, any K, uh, any constant is always what divided by what? Okay, it can be KC, can be KP, whatever. It's always products over reactants. The products in this case, PB2 plus N, CL minus, and squared. Yes, okay, correct. The, the coefficients become the power. Okay, but here to be divided by the reactants. No, uh, we don't. Because this is a solid. A solid does not have any concentration. So for KSP, it is the only special case uh, where we don't have a divide reactants. Uh. It's just the products multiplied together. And so far. Okay, so that's KSP. Uh. And then we look at part two, where they ask us to calculate the solubility product. And they ask us to use relevant data from the table. Perhaps you guys can just tell me what data are we supposed to pick out from the table? Ah, okay, so they gave us the solubility of PBCL2, which is what? Okay, 4.7 watts. Okay, so they gave us in grams per dm cube. Guys, do we ever want to discuss, uh, do we ever want to calculate in grams per dm cube? This concentration is in what? Mole per dm cube, right? So guys, I'm sure you guys know how to convert this into mole per dm cube. Okay, go and give that a try yourself. Okay, but after that happens then, after we found the solubility of PBCL2, then how do we substitute it into the KSP expression? So remember, uh, guys, this is where you need to let, right, your solubility of PBCL2 S. So S represents the solubility of the salt. And I did mention this to you guys before. When it comes to solubility, right, this is the same as the change in your IC table. And do you all remember the change in IC table follows what? Follows the more ratios. Okay, take note. I went through this in the solubility topic, right? Where I justified to you guys why it follows the more ratio. Okay, the reason behind it is quite simple, lah, huh? Okay, but okay, we, we won't go all the way up here with cap something like this. Okay, so all, all I'm trying to say is this our next. If the solubility of PBCL2 is S, then PB2 plus must be what? Also S, right? Then for CL minus then it should be one. 2s because it follows the mole ratio. In other words, what we can do over here is to substitute into KSP. KSP is just S times 2s squared. Guys, what should I get here? Okay, good. For S cube. Okay, then later when you find the S value, you can just substitute it here to get the final answer. Okay, this is a very standard solubility and KSP factor. Let's turn over to part B. B is an attempt to introduce a bit of application. Okay, but you guys, this is a very simple and different question. Okay, let me write down the final answer to part C. Okay, your final answer should be 1.9 extend to 12 minus 5 around that. Okay, they ask for the units. 
No, they didn't. Okay, they even asked us to calculate two into two SF like, for some reason. Okay, so we just follow that. Although they asked us for the units in part one. Never mind, like, we just put it in part two answer. Okay, this time we have three concentration terms. So it's mole cubed PM minus nine. Now, never mind. Okay, let's try part B. Then we can quickly, swiftly move on to other types of questions, really. So you don't even need to, to find S13 in the periodic table because they just told you to be low iodine. So you can think of it as the trends that you have learned so far apply here. You are going down the periodic table, but down the group. So when it comes to all the whatever trends that they are testing for in this question, it will be the same trend. Okay, just need to write two equations with state symbols. Okay, so give you another two minutes for this. Okay, we've seen this question before. Estatine reaction, uh, sorry, displacement reaction. Okay, you mix a halogen and a key light. You have to check whether the reaction is successful. And there's a rule for that. That we have used last lesson. Okay, come. let's discuss the question first. Huh? Now, they give you a lot of things. Okay, they give you acetine, they give you whatever. Then suddenly you look at the part, like part one and part two. Then you will notice what's happening already. So guys, what's the underlying property that they are testing over here? Halogens and they are what? What exactly about the halogen are we looking at? They are strengths as oxidizing agents, right? Okay, so how do we know that? Okay, because uh, you all know this part one and part two, they mix a halogen with a different k -line. Now, looking at a trend that we have learned before, we know that the strength as oxidizing agents down the group will increase or decrease. It is a must know, huh? it drops down the group. It becomes weaker and weaker oxidizing agents. Now, you may be asking me, in an exam, am I supposed to figure this out first? No. Because whenever you see the halogen and the halide, you must be reminded of this statement. The halogen 
higher in the periodic table or higher in the group will oxidize the halide phenomenon. So it's about recognizing pressure types. Huh? I do not need you guys to know, like I do not need you all to remember, oh, oxidizing agent, does it become stronger or weaker? Then you'll end up going to work it out. Then you spend so much time on the two mark question. No point. How do we derive the strength of oxidizing agents from? Because I want you all to see, uh, halogen higher in the group oxidize a halide phenomenon. From this statement alone, uh, higher or lower is stronger. Higher, right? Higher is more powerful to oxidize than halide phenomenon. So higher means stronger. That means as you go down the group, it becomes weaker. So that's how you use this trend from this statement. So you don't need to remember this statement. Lah. Now remember, you should know the difference between hydrogen and halide. Hydrogen is x2, halide is x minus ion. So you take a look at the first sentence. Ah. First sentence is bromine and acetate. I'm sure you can infer acetate is your halide. So Pr2 and A E minus. Guys, can this reaction occur? Yes, you based on this statement here, bromine is above acetate. So this statement, can this reaction can occur? So I want you guys to change Br2 into what? Okay, Br2 can only reduce to Br minus, whereas A T minus will turn into what? Okay, it will turn into A T2. Now they also mentioned we need to write state symbols now. Okay, so let's just fill all this up first. Okay, we did mention before K lights are always in the equal state, and here they told us bromine is in the equal state. So that's the right. Okay, the only issue is uh, what is the state symbol for acetate? Any clue? Okay, good, solid. Okay, because uh, you're supposed to ask yourself, acetate at roof conditions is what state? And as you can tell, uh, we already know that the volatility drops, right? In other words, from gas, gas, become liquid, become solid. So this one, 100% must be solid also. So try to infer all the different state symbols are, then you should include that into your fraction as well. However, I personally think uh, I will accept another answer which is A T2 equals. Because uh, when this reaction happens, you may not be getting chlorine gas if you use chlorine instead. You might get equals chlorine. So it could exist in an equal state. Like uh. if you use PR minus, uh, you might get PR2 equals. Definitely possible also. But here the answer includes solid. Uh. So I think it's still acceptable, but I feel that equals can you can get away with equals also. Let's try the second one. Okay, guys, part two. Can this reaction occur? No. Okay, so acetine is below Cl minus. This just doesn't happen. You do not need to write an equation. I just need y'all to explain. Okay, I know they said that right there no reaction, but let's explain first. Okay, why? Are, why can't this reaction happen? Acetine is a what? Compared to chlorine, acetine is a, what's all this about? Oxidizing agent, right? Acetine is a weaker oxidizing agent than chlorine. Okay, so hence, acetine AT2 cannot oxidize Cl- to Cl2. Very simple statement over here. Sometimes they can ask you to explain. And all I just need to see uh, is the word weaker or stronger oxidizing agent. That's pretty much it. Okay, so it's very important. Huh? Okay, we'll try one more uh, question, uh, one more exam ish question, then we can take a break from this. Okay, so let's quickly move on from here. Right? Okay, all good. Okay, nice. Okay, come, let's turn over to question five. Question five starts to get important. Later after question five, we'll do something similar as well in the level up question. Then we will pretty much be done with this segment already. Okay, not much question types for me to cover. Okay, we still need another hour for the other set of tutorial. Okay, come, guys, take a look at question five. Again, I want you all to try part one. Part one is just to establish your explanation skills again. Are you able to fulfill all the keywords for thermal decomposition? Okay, let's find out over here. Okay, it is part two and part three that we'll go through together.
Okay, does that treat you? Again, very quickly, just run through your explanation for part one because what I really want to focus on is two and three. Okay, but you need part one for the second and third part. Okay, I'll start to list down the keywords again in short form. Answer on the board for part one, right? I'm gonna give part two a try. Go ahead. So, if it is part three, that I'll have to do it with regret. You know it. Okay. Once you have confirmed your answer in part two, uh, I'll leave you guys to give part three a try or so. Okay, but remember for part one here, they are asking not for thermal stability but for decomposition temperature. 
Everything else is the same, but just the last step, decomposition temperature increases. How do I know that? It's because you require more energy to break the bond, right? More energy just means temperature is higher, no? Right? Should I have any issues here? Okay, guys, let's discuss part two. Huh? Yeah, I want you guys to tell me which compound belongs to which graph. Right, maybe I'll give you all another one more minute to think about this. Then we'll go through. Okay, you don't need to justify anything. This question is nice enough for you to not need to explain anything. Okay. Okay, so you guys have filled the answer. Okay, let's try this. Okay, so you should know the order and we should go down the group first. It's magnesium, calcium, then finally uh, barium. Okay, and first of all, the decomposition temperature, it's harder and harder to try to break these compounds down. Okay, that's, that, that's the easy way of interpreting this. Huh? Now, you take a look at this compound here, uh, this graph. They say that uh, you heat it at T degrees Celsius. I have no idea what this temperature is. But then, uh, what do you notice about this graph? What does A imply? Is there any decomposition? No. Okay, but B, there is a decomposition. Guys, can you tell me why the mass drops? Why does the mass drop? Uh? Okay, of course, when you decompose something, yes, you are breaking it down into further substances, but it doesn't necessarily mean it must drop, uh, right? So can you just tell me first, uh, can you look at the equation at which this happens? Or first of all, before that, uh, let's just identify this first, before we answer this question. Yes. B, there's decomposition. A, there's no decomposition. Between barium and calcium, who should A? Who does not decompose? Is the one that's harder to decompose, right? And the one that's harder to decompose has to be barium. So A should be for barium carbonate. Can see that? Okay, let me put a 1.12 here. And then B will be for calcium carbonate. Now again, you do not need to know what that temperature is. You do know that barium is harder to decompose. So clearly it is the one that doesn't decompose. Ah. Okay, very simple question. But now, ah, okay, can you all just tell me, okay, for calcium carbonate, when you decompose really, what is this equation that you get? Calcium carbonate will decompose for other products. They can ask for this. Ah. Okay, what are the products? Carbon dioxide is one, definitely, yes. And calcium oxide. Okay, I remember telling you guys also that the metal oxides are the only thermally stable compound. Carbonates, nitrates, hydroxides, they are thermally unstable, meaning they can turn into further stuff. Meaning to say, uh, when you heat this guy, right, no matter what, you get calcium oxide because this guy cannot break down into any further compound. So, Taking a look at this, right? I'm sure you guys can see why the mass drops. Why does the mass drop? Because of carbon dioxide is escaping, mass, so clearly you're losing some substance. So clearly the mass drops. But the second question that I also want to ask is what does 1.12 represent? Why 1.12? Why not like zero or why exactly 1.12? 1.12 is the mass of what? Calcium oxide, good. Okay, so we need to say, uh, guys, if we start off at 2 grams, this guy is 1.12 grams, how do we even calculate this 1.12? Uh? Or is it they have to give us? Uh? Okay, this can be calculated, uh, actually. Guys, how will you calculate this value if they were to ask you to calculate the value? What will you do? Just tell me your steps. You don't need to go and work it out. Find the most of calcium carbonate and then... How do you get the most of this? Okay, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, good. And then it times the MR. Yes, as you can see, uh, the MR of this guy is smaller than this. So given that they both have the same amount, the mass will be smaller here. Very nice. Okay, so you all know how to calculate this value if prompted. Now, give you guys some time to try part three. 
Okay, draw a pencil because your answer might be wrong. Okay, okay so for the third part, please draw a pencil. Right? Okay, now they're asking about magnesium. Huh? We haven't discussed this good yet. He tried the sketch of the group. Okay, come, uh, let's go through the answer. Okay, so how will your graph look like? Okay, so let's go over some features. Huh? Will it be higher than B or lower than B? Higher? No, it should be lower. Okay, why? Guys, if you notice, huh, they also start off at 2 grams of magnesium carbonate. But here, before any calculations, can you predict really whether the mass here is higher or lower? Oh, actually, I think it's best to calculate because here already different. Okay, now magnesium carbonate you divide by the MR, you get the number of moles, right? And then you one to one mole ratio, you multiply by this guy's MR, you get 0 0.956 grams. Because the MR is smaller, okay, so your mass is definitely going to be smaller. Okay, that's number one. Okay, then the second thing to take note of uh, is if you come up here, you it's quite it's quite clear that your constant mass to be 0 0.956 lower than this. Okay. But if I were to draw, okay, this is what you guys will probably draw. And then this is for magnesium carbonate. You label this as 0 0.956. Oh, a little bit more. Okay, but yeah. So let's write down the features of the graph. Huh? The first feature is that he has a lower constant mass. We already know why. This one should be the very first thing that you guys notice. Now, what is the second thing that you notice for this graph? This graph, by the way, is still wrong. Huh? There's a reason for that. Okay, if you all to draw this graph, which is what a lot of you guys will do, it is still wrong. Okay, what's the second feature? Guys, when it comes to the decomposition, magnesium is easier or harder than the other two. It's easier. If it's easier to decompose, will it be faster or slower? Faster. Okay, guys, so the next thing uh, is you must have faster decomposition shown in your graph. What is the feature uh, of faster decomposition? How do you tell? Steeper. Good. Okay, the curve has to have a steeper gradient. 
and inevitably, uh, you will fulfill this condition also because chaos see, right? If you want to stop at a lower point, you must have a, a, a lower gradient as well. I mean, you wouldn't have the same gradient and then you stop like somewhere here. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, you guys will automatically draw a steeper gradient to reach a lower point. It's not about this. Okay, it is the third factor, the third feature of this graph that a lot of people tend to miss out on. So I already told you guys that this graph currently, this red color one uh, is wrong. And it still has something to do with speed and rate. Guys, we already know uh, that this guy decomposes at a faster rate. Okay, so the third question is this. How long does it take to reach constant mass? Faster or slower? Also faster, right? Does this show you that you reach constant mass as uh, faster? No, can you see uh, it reaches constant mass kind of like later than that, right? So what should you be doing here? How could the graph finally look like? If you are supposed to reach constant mass faster, that means the third feature uh, is I need to see the plateau earlier. It has to reach constant mass earlier, basically. Okay, let me write this down. It has to reach constant mass earlier. This is the most important feature most people miss out on. That's why I say graph drawing questions are never easy uh, because of the amount of detail that goes into it. I want you guys to look at this first. It reaches constant mass here. And for any avoidance of doubt, right? I need it to be super obvious. I want you all to like maybe stop here, right? And then just constant throughout. It's very clear right now that it reaches constant mass a lot earlier than graph B. Make it as steep as you can, such that you can achieve this effect. Third point, very important. I need y'all to have all these three features now. So we'll practice one more of this question afterwards. Okay. Ken? Any questions here? No, huh? Now, uh, before we take a break, uh, okay, I want you guys to turn over to level up question two. It's the same exact question, but since we already did it once, uh, I want you guys to try this whole question yourself. Right after this, then we can take a break. Okay. Level up question two is the RI 2009 question. As relevant as it is to be, it's still as relevant. Okay, I suggest, right, do part one, then part three, then part two. Okay, I repeat, okay, because it's better to do three first than to do part two, right? Same exact principle. Go and give it.
Okay, answer for power is number four. Okay, you should have calculated the value of x. Okay, I mentioned already, x represents the mass of calcium oxide. And you just need to find mole ratio and multiply by the MR. Shouldn't be a skew here. Okay. Okay, so let me change the value of x to be 0 0.560. Okay, the graph for part two, you probably already know how to do it because we did the question earlier. Okay, but it actually makes more sense if you guys explain part three first and use this explanation to help you draw the graph. So part three, this right here is your standard explanation. However, because this question here is four marks, there's a reason why it's four marks. It's not just for this. Because later, we're going to use this to help to talk about the sketch. So this is not the final answer yet. This is not the, the full answer. Later on, we'll continue this answer by talking about how it will affect the shape of the graph, like some features and whatnot. Okay, so we'll add it on later. Okay, but as of right now, let's take a look first. Uh. Magnesium carbonate, should it end lower or should it end higher? Okay, it should be lower because you can go and calculate. Uh. But magnesium has a lower MR, so it should have a lower mass. You don't believe you can calculate it. And in fact, I think you need to calculate it. Uh, because you're supposed to tell me when it stops. Okay, so it stops at what value? 0 0.478. So let's draw this again. If you have three features up, but this right here should be lower. Okay, zero point four seven eight grams. That's the first feature. Second feature, it has to be steeper. Now, of course, it's definitely steeper, lah. Okay, so you have okay, definitely steeper. And last of all, it has to end earlier. Okay, you can clearly see this one ends quite late. Just make sure it ends way earlier than that. Three different features. Okay, we have to now put it into words. Lah. Okay, so let's add on to this explanation. Lah. Yes, NGCO3 is less thermally stable. Then let's talk about the graph. Hence, okay, the decomposition curve of MGCO3 has to be steeper. Okay, as the rate is faster. Okay, so I'm just saying it's steeper. I'm just explaining the features. Lah. Apart from it being steeper, you also must say it also reaches the constant mass earlier. You can even say the constant mass is 0 0.478, but not that it really matters because it's your graph already. So two features. Lah. I think I explained three features here. Uh, reaches a lower constant mass earlier. Okay, so now I've already incorporated all three features into just this one point. So let me recount all this again. Huh? First feature, the mass has to be lower. I say here lower. Second feature, because it's faster, I justified it. So the curve has to be steeper. Third feature, it reaches that mass earlier. See, huh? I made my answer super concise in just two sentences. Okay, so that's the reason why this part three is four marks because you have to justify the shape of the graph. How do you know that? Because they said account for your sketch. I want to highlight that in your, in your question. When they say account for the sketch, it means you need to try to explain the features of the graph. Okay, you have to explain the features of the graph. Okay, very important question. In fact, this is like the most important question in this entire chapter. Group two, group 17, and period three included. Most important. Okay. Once you master this question, now, they can't really change much. Let me give you some time to think of it first. Okay. Uh, but anyways, uh, once you finish talking, okay, we can take a break. Right? Then we'll move on to period three after this. Okay, now, uh, we are pretty much done with all the possible question types for group two and group 17. Now let's take a look at period three. Period three is a lot more straightforward. I can tell you guys right now. Because there's, there's really not much application question. So today I'm going to try only one kind of question that is a little bit more on the other side. Okay, so I need you all to take a look at page 8. Sorry, question 8, question 8. Okay, question 8 uh, is a so-called uh, elucidation question. You guys have seen structural elucidation for organic chem. In other words, you are meant to find out the unknown compounds. This one is clearly a lot easier because it's not an uh, organic chem. Uh, that's not what. Number two, uh, there's only a limited number of oxides and chlorides that you have learned. 
Okay, essentially, uh, we're going to skip A, part B. Part B is just for you to remember your content and copy and paste. We don't have time to do that in class, and there's no point. I want you guys to take a look at part C. Because for part C, uh, they give you guys a lot of information, and you are meant to deduce that information. Okay, of course, uh, I don't expect you guys to memorize every single reaction by now. Lah. So what I want you guys to do, maybe, okay, I'll let you guys use your notes. Okay, but more importantly, go ahead and deduce all the possible species over here first. Okay, later on they ask you to write reaction equations. Uh, that one don't do yet because study you get wrong. So just uh, elucidate all the species first. Okay, B, C, D, and E. Okay. okay, they give you a lot of clues. Okay, you don't need to you don't need to explain now. Okay, here they never ask for explanation. This one is not organic chem structure elucidation.
So I have the equations on the board here. Sorry, not equations. Okay, but I have the question on the board over here. Okay, we're going to slowly deduce these structures. Okay, you guys might have your rough ideas of what these structures are already. Okay, but then we shall discuss exactly how to work this out. Okay, because I know you all need to refer the notes and all that. Okay, so I'm going to ask you all questions. You all just take out the answers from the notes. Okay, so first thing is this. Uh, B and B, C, D and E are all oxides of chloride. You three elements. So they're not elements first, okay? Because most of the questions they ask for elements. And then they are oxides and chlorides, they ask for other stuff. So let's look at B and C first. B and C have high melting points, B and E have low melting points. What are some possible answers that you can deduce from over here? Okay, maybe we don't know the exact structure because there's so many structures, right? It could be an oxide, it could be a chloride. But you want to make a guess, otherwise. Right? Oxides and chlorides with high melting points have what kind of structure? It could possibly be ionic compounds, okay, or what? Any other possible ones? Okay, giant covalent, okay, good. Uh, how about low melting points? Okay, we are looking at the simple molecular structures. Okay, so this will help us narrow down a little bit. So you all need to think of structures. Why do you all think of structures and not the compound? Because it could be either oxides or chlorides. You want to list down can lah. You take about. 10 minutes listing down all the possible elements. Okay, since you're not very sure about that, you're going to take longer also. Only when you're very, very comfortable with this topic with you, then perhaps you can list that down. Okay, but still not the best and wisest decision because, once again, this is a better way of looking at it. Next. Okay, so this will help us narrow down later. P is still soluble in water, but soluble in hot concentrated annual ditch. Guys, there's one particular compound that can only dissolve in hot concentrated annual gauge. There's a reason why they mentioned like such a strong region. So what is B actually? Ah, okay, based on this alone, uh, you can actually already tell B is SiO2. Because our uh, SiO2 is weakly acidic, super weak acid. If it's such a weak acid, uh, you need a very strong base for it to react. Does that make sense? Something so weak, you need something stronger to push it to react. Okay, so just based on this, uh, B is SiO2 really. Again, good news is you don't even need to mention, you don't even need to justify anything. Okay, so it's true, B is under the giant covalent portion. Okay, but then let's look at the rest, C, D, and E. Okay, the last two reactions are a little bit more uh, challenging. C, D, and E, you add water, okay, you get a few solutions here, right? Okay, so let's go one by one. Huh? Okay, later I'll let you copy. Okay, C is a neutral solution. What does that imply, uh, guys? Neutral means pH 7, yes, very simple. But what does that imply about C and water? You try to add water, but you get neutral solution. That means C is what? C is, is C soluble in water? No, it's actually not. Because C is not soluble in water, that's why it's neutral. Can okay, you see that? Okay, so the thing is, uh, can it, is it a chloride or is it an oxide? There's actually only one answer over here. So, of course, when you when you think that time, right, you would ask yourself, is it chloride or is it oxide? Agree? Now, for chlorides, uh, when you add water, will you ever get a neutral solution? Okay, actually, usually no, but there's only one compound which can give you a neutral solution, and that is NaCl. So, it could be entirely possible that NaCl is your compound, right? Let's just list down possibilities first. So, so far, is NaCl possible? You see, uh, C is NaCl. C has high melting point. Is it ionic? Yes. Okay, so possible answer. With any, okay, any, any more chlorides that are neutral? No, uh, if you look at the pH of your chlorides, only NaCl is neutral. So now let's move on to oxides. Okay, guys, oxides, what are some possible answers? What oxides cannot dissolve in water? Okay, Al2O3 is one because this guy is just too difficult to dissolve already. Anything else? SiO2, but guys, can it be SiO2? No, because we already have E as SiO2. So our answer is only narrowed down to these two answers. As for what it is, okay, are there any more clues in this question? Let's see later. Okay. Come, let's move on. D and E give an acidic solution. If they give an acidic solution, what could this be? 
Okay, what are some possible answers for D and E? Yeah? Okay, let's start off with oxides first. What kind of oxide is dissolved in water to give acidic solution? Right? Just list down the oxides to me. Okay, got P4O10, good. Okay, acidic oxide number one. Any, any more? Okay, got SO3. Okay, that's for the oxides. Lah. Okay, how about chlorides? Any acidic chlorides here? In fact, we all do this uh, that everything is basically an acidic chloride. Yeah, okay, everything except for NaCl, uh, the pH will be less than 7. So it could be many chlorides, it could be MgCl2, AlCl3, could be SiCl4, could be PCl5. Any one of these guys over here. Alright? Okay, so this is where wow, I can't narrow down anything. Okay, but now let's take a look. When we take a look at the last information, this last piece of information, what does this actually, what, what are they trying to tell you here? What does AgNO3 try to facilitate? What even are they trying to facilitate here? You look at all the possible compounds of E, uh, is there anything, any element that can form facilitate AgNO3? What atom here can facilitate? Okay, want to make a guess? Ag. Precipitate. Okay, just take note from now on. Uh, AgNO3 is usually to precipitate AgX. In this case, is there a halogen X in any of these compounds? Have, right? Can you see there's chlorines all over the place? So, in other words, it cannot be the two oxides over here because you must be able to form an AgCl precipitate. Agree? So it has to be one of the chlorides. Lah. But the question is, which chloride? How do we narrow this down? What information do we now need to use? Okay, you all see the 0 0.1 and 0 0.5, right? That one, the numbers they never give for fun. What is the mole ratio over here? 0 0.1 and 0.5. It is a 1 to 5 ratio, right? So 1 is to 5 ratio, that means you need 5 AgNO3. That means you also have 5 Cl ion 5. Which one, which one of these compounds got 5, 5 Cl? That's the answer for you. Can you see that? PCl5, because 5 Cl require 5 Ag to form AgCl. Make sense? That's why it's a 1 is to 5 ratio. That's why when you list down all the options, uh, you realize only one of them have 5 chlorines. That's why it's 1 to 5. If it's ALCL3, then uh, how much is ALCL3 do you need? If it was this set. You need 0.3 moles. Yeah, it's obvious as that. Uh. Yeah, you can see that. Okay, so we have settled B. We have settled B. We are not very sure what C is yet. Okay, but never mind. Let's take a look at what this. Okay, guys, E then. The most important clue is down here lah, because E can be any one of these, including the oxides. Okay, what could E be? It requires two moles of NaOH for complete neutralization. Which kind of these guys are require NaO can react with NaOH? Huh? You all look at chlorides versus oxides. Which one can react with NaOH? Okay, if you all realize uh, chlorides, I only discuss the reaction with water. But for oxides, there's acid-based reactions. So clearly it has to be one of the oxides. Which can require only two moles of NaOH? E4O10 or SO3? Okay, so this one. Here. It's SO3. If you don't believe, you can write down both equations as well. P4O10 with OH minus will give you PO43 minus. And water. Four P's, so four here. 12 minus, so here must be 12 OH minus. One more P4O10 requires 12 moles of NaOH. That's clearly wrong. Okay, it is SO3, and you can write this equation because they did ask for uh, reactions equations also. And as you can see over here, this is a very nice one is the two ratio, which means uh, we know P is SO3. I say again, uh, why did we exclude all the chlorides? It's because chlorides don't have acid based reactions. What? Chlorides are not acidic nor basic. Okay. That's why you all must know the this image here very important. So guys, we have D, we have E, we have E. How about C? So C are only gave us one item, but which one do you all think is the better answer here? This is the only information they give. 
And the only information they gave other than this uh, is the fact that C has a higher tipping point. I mean, which one uh, do you think is better? If you want to really highlight the idea of high mounting point, uh, which one would be the better answer? Hey, they really never give us anything else, really. AL203, exactly, that's the answer. Because guys, if you all compare, this cell, the melting point actually not super high. AL203 is the true definition of high melting point. So the lovely better answer here is AL203. Okay, it's the better of the two options. Uh, again, both are possible, but AL203 is objectively higher. Okay, you don't even know the actual melting point, uh, but you can infer. Okay. Okay, so they did ask you that okay, six marks are uh, okay. I think four marks goes to B, C, D, E, and then the last two marks come in all the equations. I think that's how they're gonna allocate the marks. Uh. Okay, so for equations, that one right, okay, again, don't just copy straight from the notes, try to balance it yourself like what I just did. Okay, we work with now, uh, okay, now you all can try yourself again. Uh, why period three? Uh, I never focus on it so much because if you all scroll through, uh, there are no level up questions, all of them uh, are level one questions. Because there's really not much they can test in period three from uh, this topic over here. But of course, not to say that y'all should ignore this. Uh, okay, y'all should go back, study the notes, and then use that set of notes, right? Okay, don't just copy paste your answers into the tutorial. You must try your best uh, to remember the options. Okay, really, you must try your best to remember the options. Okay. So any final questions for me? No, uh? okay, again, revision should mainly focus on group 2, group 17. Period 3 questions, revise yourself. You can really just plug and place on a very, very doable topic. Okay, with that said, that's it for today. Okay, can I?